Although I've been in the car space for many years, we actually never crossed paths until one late night at TED. Uh, so uh, Mark and I are both fortunate enough to be uh, TEDsters. And one of my favorite TED moments is, what was that, 11.30 at night? And, uh, late at night, and TED is like a sleep deprivation experience. Um, we started talking about our startup experience, and then we sat for like three hours until the wee hours of the morning, and Mark told me the actual story of what happened with Tesla, and I couldn't stop listening until, okay, it's time to go to bed. Um, so we've been communicating with every TED ever since and kind of became closer colleagues since. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce Mark. I think what you're going to hear is fascinating of what actually happened with Tesla with that. Thank you. So uh, in 2003, my business partner, Martin Eberhardt, and I uh, started Tesla Motors. Now, we had had a successful startup in the past, and we had made electronic books and, and sold that, weirdly, to TV Guide, which is a whole separate thing, is why a TV Guide company would buy a book company, but you know, it was a great exit, everybody was happy. Um, so we were trying to figure out what to do, and we believe we should be looking for a problem to solve. And you know, every, as everybody does, right, whether it's you know, how to you know, rent uh, stuff better or whatever, we're looking <coughs> for a problem. And we, for whatever reason, picked oil. Now, it's kind of a big problem, and there's a lot of reasons why oil is a problem. And you know, the neat thing is, is that whether you're an environmentalist or uh, you know, you're worried about economics or politics, um, oil is bad news sort of all around. You know, we have this addiction to it. Even though it's a little bit less today, it's still you know, gigantic. So this was what we decided to attack. Now, we looked at a whole bunch of different things, but this is weirdly the only one we could think we could make a difference with, which shows you maybe some of our other ideas were not as clever as we thought. If you look at oil um, in the US, basically everything is in transportation. And actually, on the plane coming down here, I saw new numbers, and it's about 75% transportation now. Uh, so you know it's both good and bad. Uh, and if you look within transportation, it's really about cars. And you know we know that, right? I mean, that, you know, cars are, are really what does it. In, we had 500, this I'm sure was taken you know, in LA. Uh, there, was, there, there was 500 million cars in 1986. And today there's about a billion cars, Oops. about a billion cars. Um, and really soon now, because of the emerging world, we're gonna be up to oh, well over two billion cars. It's really hard to imagine how we're gonna power those with oil. Even, uh, so I was at a talk by the uh, retiring head of, of uh, Saudi Aramco, which is the big, you know, the big kahuna in, in OPEC. And uh, someone asked him about electric cars, and he said, oh, we think they're a good idea because you know, we, imagine how we can get to 100 million barrels a day. The world consumes about 80, 85 million barrels a day right now. And he says, you know, even at the level of driving of Europe, if Asia achieves 10% of that, we, we're, we don't have any idea of how we can make more oil, apart from the environmental and economic issues. So we gotta do something. And if it's not gonna be oil, what is it? So we looked around, and there's a lot of different possibilities, and the, the VCs were particularly interested in hydrogen fuel cells at the time. I have a whole presentation of why that's really a nutty idea. We looked at it from a couple different resource uh, comparisons, and we did this thing called well-to-wheel energy efficiency, which is how you measure such things. The energy that bubbles out of the ground, whatever form, or whatever you have to do to process it, to making your car go, and, and how efficient that is, uh, from that well to the wheel. And if you look, a pretty good car is 26 miles per gallon, and we did this for every conceivable fuel source, and uh, you know, we have a whole white paper on that. And that's the energy content, according to the uh, Petroleum Society, of a gallon of oil. Notice it's really huge, 36 kilowatt hours. It's, it, it, um, it's really, really a lot. Um, production efficiency, oil is really efficient to pull out of the ground. Uh, the, the unconventional oil isn't nearly as efficient, but conventional oil is, is quite efficient. So what that translates into is about 1,700 watt hours per mile. So when you drive, it's about 1,700 watt hours per mile. And a really nice like, uh, uh, gasoline powered car, you can get down to about 1,000 uh, watt hours per mile. So we looked at electric cars, and as I said, I have a whole presentation, and I won't, I won't do that on this one, but electric cars are very, very efficient once the energy is on board. So it's about 250 watt hours per mile on board, but you have to make the electricity, you have to transport it and stuff. So one of the questions people ask about electric cars a lot is, well, what if, you know, how if, is it just moving the problem somewhere else? Well, if you look at this and you say, well, the worst possible case is a legacy coal plant. 
They just suck in all ways. You gotta remove mountains to feed the things, but their energy efficiency is terrible. It's only 29% of this coal, actually the energy that com in the coal actually makes it into electrons. It's, it's just a disaster. So when you work that all out, if you power an electric car with a legacy coal plant, which would, you, there's no place you could really do that, but if you did that, it would still be better than even a really good gasoline powered car, uh, which you know is, is pretty uh, surprising. And if you use a state of the art coal plant, like they use in Asian, advanced Asian economies, they're much more efficient at making, making electricity. So that drops the watt hours per mile down further. And if you use natural gas, which is what most of, of the US uses now, they're 60% efficient, which is huge if you're in this world, and you get down to, to half a kilowatt hour uh, per mile. So you can see if you lay this out that electric cars just rock. I mean, and, and the hydrogen fuel cell cars would be way down here. Um, a pretty good gas power car is here, but even a legacy coal electric car is still better than the best gasoline car in terms of, of the energy efficiency. And ultimately that's what matters. You gotta, you gotta find something, you wanna use your resources as efficiently as you possibly can. So we were convinced that electric cars were the way to go. And the thing that we really liked about it, being you know, kind of anarchists in a way, is that it, you don't have to use fossil fuels at all, obviously, to make electricity. You can make electricity from all kinds of different things. So this is a, a fabulous solar uh, array out in the desert somewhere in California. And you can see these equivalents. This is this thing, that, this is 36, you know, 360,000 cars can drive there, you know, drive around and not use any fossil fuels at all. So you know, that, that begins to affect the, the oil uh, equation. And you know, these are kind of, you can sort of see the parking lots, about 400 cars you can power. And the neat thing about it is it goes all the way down to an individual. So that is enough solar panels to power your car for 12,000 miles a year of driving. And the neat thing is when you do that, you're no longer consuming any actual, all you're driving is solar power. It, it's a very cool thing. And it isn't, now the reality is of course you actually don't charge your car during the day. It's much more uh, economically efficient to feed that to the grid at high prices and then buy back cheap electricity at night. Um, so it's not quite, but, but it's, uh, that's how much energy it would take to, to power that car. It just doesn't seem that much. And this is Martin with his Roadster uh, and his solar panels. And he has a completely solar powered car here in LA. So we were convinced that, electric, that electric cars were gonna be the winner because no matter how we measured it, it was the most efficient fuel thing. We looked at biofuels, we looked at you know, the ethanol derivatives, uh, we looked at, of course, the hydrogen fuel cells, and all of those suck for a variety of reasons. Um, but electric cars, you know, they were super efficient in all the resources we cared about. So we thought, well, now we have the answer. We know what the answer is going to be, but then what do you do with that? Now, in 2003, there were electric cars that existed. And these were what you could get in 2003. Um, and, and these were all examples of actual electric cars that were for sale. And for some reason, they were not selling at all. And, and the industry said, there, there aren't, there's no demand for electric cars. Look, at there's all these other cars out there, and nobody buys that kind of piece of junk. And, and the only car that was at all interesting in the electric car space was the EV1. And it had been mandated essentially in California and eventually GM paid enough money to Sacramento and got the zero emissions mandate rewritten. So they were able to pull those leases back and crush them. And there was a movie about it and it came out about later. The interesting thing about this, and this is what actually gave us the hope that we could make this happen, um, is the quotes from GM. Now, so remember GM was the world's largest and most successful company for a long time. And every quarter for 40 years became less successful and less good. And so finally they went bankrupt. Um, and you have to have a decision-making process in place to always ensure that you make the wrong decision across that period of time because randomly you would make some good decisions and some bad decisions. And GM, and GM I mean, it's a pretty good case study that they actually had a, a decision process in place to ensure bad decisions because you can't do that by chance. Anyway, so. So they said this very simple thing. I said, you know, there weren't enough people at any given time to make the EVs, you know, viable for them. Um, the car never had appeal beyond a core group of, what does it say, uh, technology enthusiasts and environmentalists. Well, it turns out that the tree huggers and geeks have a lot of money. So 
This was the only car that GM has produced in 30 years that sold into the very top economic bracket in the country. The average income in 2003 of an EV1 leaseor was $250,000. Um, and we know most of those people because they bought Teslas later. Mm -hmm. And they tell these incredible stories of dealing with GM and having you know, the body of their Wilson Sun Sydney lawyer being crushed by the marshals as they take their EV1 away because they really wanted to keep those cars. They, were so, they wanted them so much. This also says that they weren't doing it to save money, which is a huge misconception in electric cars, that people buy electric cars to save money because it's cheaper driving per mile. So that, you know, we looked around, we saw what they had done and the customer base that they accessed. We thought, what can we do better? How can our product be more successful than what was out there? So EVs have a bunch of advantages. Um, they're super energy efficient, as we know. I mean, we just, you know, we went through all the math on that. They have a really funny drivetrain in that it's kind of heavy, but it can be in this funny shape so that it can be quite compact. The, uh, the actual motor and uh, electronics and stuff is, is, is quite small. If you ever get in a Model S, you know, there's trunk space and front space and under trunk space and everything else because the drivetrain is really tiny. Um, and they have wickedly fast acceleration. So, and it turns out that people like that. And of course, they have no oil and emissions, which apparently rich people are willing to pay for. And I'm going to go back to rich people in a moment, which is why I'm so focused on that particular market. So, and they have some challenges. They have long charge times, but they have, ex and they're expensive to make. The batteries are expensive. But that's okay if they're really compelling and you're addressing a, a market that can pay for it, which is why we had to go to something that rich people like. And I say that, you know, kind of not being, you know, flippant, but new technology frequently is quite expensive and it comes in at the top. Cell phones used to be $2,000 a piece and only super, you know, executives could afford them. And you've got to be able to, to get that market share and get that volumes up to push it down. So it's weird to think that electric cars would start at the cheapest possible thing for people that don't want to, that can't afford to, to spend money on gas. It, it just makes no sense. Um, so we thought about that and we thought, you know, a sports car, it turns out we can have, because of this incredibly efficient and, and incredibly fast performance, we can outperform almost any sports car made. Um, and it turns out that Priuses were selling really well in 2003. Now, Lexus didn't, they were a little shocked. The Prius was a little bit of a publicity stunt. They brought it out to California for a variety of political reasons. They didn't expect it to sell very well and it sold pretty well, which, you know, again, was a little bit of a surprise, but what freaked them out is that it cannibalized their Lexus sales. So they, they were, you know, people were trading in their Lexuses and getting a Prius, which was built on their absolute cheapest possible platform that Toyota made at the time. So again, Toyota thought that Priuses would only be for people that wanted to save money on <coughs> gas. And instead, it was for people who had discretionary money that wanted to make a state, you know, cars are all about statement. I mean, my God, LA, I mean, it's, it, cars are about making a statement. And these people bought Priuses to make a statement, to do the right thing. Whatever, for whatever reason they wanted to do the right thing, they were doing the right thing. And so in, in where I live, in, in, or near where I live is in Palo Alto, and it was a cliche. I mean, every driveway had a Prius and a Porsche parked right next to it. Because they had traded in the other car to get a Prius. Um, and that was not trying to save money. They spent more on lattes than all the gas that they consumed. But they were, they were really believed that they had to reduce oil consumption for whatever, for whatever, if it was a political reason, environmental reason, it didn't matter to us. So we imagined we could make an electric sports car that would be compelling. Um, and we spent a lot of time doing computer modeling. And I say computer modeling, it sounds very sophisticated. We used Excel as our modeling platform, um, <laughs> which turns out that's all you need actually for a lot of stuff. Uh, and we figured that we could get a zero to 60 time under four seconds, which at the, in 2003, only a few supercars were able to do that uh, because electric drive is just wickedly fast <laughs> acceleration. Uh, and we could have a tremendously efficient car, you know, you know well over 130 miles per gallon equivalent. And the range was our concern. And we thought if we could just make it over 200 miles, People don't drive more than 200 miles in a day, particularly a sports car. They wake up in the morning, they have a 200 mile range. You drive around all day, even in LA, and you get home and you still probably have 100 miles left. So you don't even, and then of course the next morning, it's all full again. So the idea of having charge points and everything, we didn't want to have that chicken and egg problem. 
So we had this idea of a sports car, and we believed we could do it. So now here's the, the you know, what do we do as entrepreneurs? So of course we incorporated. So uh, in 2003, we incorporated. Uh, and we also then commissioned a company down here in Los Angeles. We'd looked around for the best sort of EV, existing EV technology. And there was a company called AC Propulsion that had some very interesting stuff at the time. So we actually paid for them to do a, a study of 18650s, which are the batteries, the only commodity lithium ion cells made. They're the ones in all the laptops and everything, although now they're all prismatic. But at the time, they were in every laptop, every camcorder. They make about a billion a year. They still make about a billion a year. Uh, and they have the highest energy density and the lowest price of, of any cells. And they're the, they're the best cells. They're the highest quality cells you can buy. So we had them validate that we could make packs out of them, large-scale packs, which the battery companies were freaked out about. Um, but we'll get to that in a second. So we had two employees, Martin and myself, um, and we also <coughs> had discovered one of my concerns was looking at the business plan and, and, and developing the financial models was, okay, we, we convinced ourselves we could develop the technology, but how do you make the car part? I mean, there's the, you know, the motors and electronics, I understand, and the software, that's Silicon Valley stuff, but what do you do about building the car? Because, you know, it's got wheels and, I don't know, headlights and everything else. Well, it turns out that in the previous 30 years, the car industry had completely changed. It used to be that GM made everything. And they completely divested themselves of all those things. So it turns out that GM buys the windshields from the same company that Toyota does. That, and you know, the, the windshield wiper motors come from some company that they, supplies the industry. So in theory, at least, we had access to the same parts. Now, it turns out to be harder to get those parts than we thought. But, but the idea, though, is that we didn't have to make much of anything. And it turned out that this sort of refactoring of the auto industry had gone so far that there were companies that made complete cars for other companies. BMWs, uh, the X3s, um, have never been made by BMW. They make, they're made by uh, Magnus Steyr in uh, Graz, Austria. They're a contract manufacturer that does everything. It builds the, the, the Saab, um, or the convertible Chevrolets and the, you know, for the European market and the Saabs, the convertible Saabs were all made not by those companies but by a contract manufacturer. So we scoured the world looking for a contract manufacturer that knew about small-scale production, ideally in sports cars, because we knew we were going to have a sports car. And we contacted Lotus, who thought we were insane. But they were, you know, you know the Brits, they kind of like crazy people. So eventually, we were able to, to get a deal with them. Um, and let's see. So we have our business plan, and then we go and raise money. Now, this was before Kickstarter, although I'm not sure we could have really done this on Kickstarter. Um, but so we went to Sand Hill Road. You know, I, I'm from Silicon Valley, you know, we go to Sand Hill Road. And you can just imagine what they would say, what, you're gonna start a car company? This is insane. But incredibly, several of the companies, several of the VCs actually thought it wasn't quite as insane as, as we thought they would think. So in April, we had investments from SDL Ventures and Compass Technology Partners, two very small VC firms. And we had a handful of angels, including uh, one super angel who lives down here is Elon Musk. So uh, he liked the idea. We pitched him in April um, or March, maybe I guess, and, and we closed in April our Series A round. And this was, you know, not convertible debt or anything. This was actually a price round because, unlike a lot of the projects that we do today, this is really capital heavy. You know, everyone says capital efficient. This is really capital inefficient. You believe a car company you have millions and millions of dollars right off the bat. So. Uh, although we were going to do it more efficiently than any car company in history had done it, but uh, we still needed lots of money. Uh, so that was in April 2004. We, we, we had five employees then, uh, and we started doing the early styling. It turns out that styling is almost the long pole in the tent, because it drives a bunch of the underlying engineering, and the engineering then drives a bunch of the styling. So the packaging gets very complicated, and you have to know what the styling is going to look like. So we did this fun thing where we went and had all the world's stylists uh, or, you know, top, you know, five of the top stylists actually submit bids in these little packages, and uh, that was one of them that we didn't take. And by this time, that was, that's J.B. Straubel, he's currently the CTO, so he was employee number five, I think, or six, I can't remember, remember. there was our, uh, he's actually, uh, Tom Coulson's running a uh, battery company right now, and we got our first office, and we're off to the races, and we also decided to make a mule. So what a mule is, is in the car industry, when they want to test a concept, uh, they take an existing platform and they hack it up 
and they put the new technology in and check it out. And it's called a mule because it takes a little bit from this and a little bit from that, but it doesn't reproduce. There's only ever going to be one of them for this particular application. So we found an old lotus elise, and by this time we were sort of in bed with lotus anyway. Um, and this was stranded for, by EPA rules. It was an Italian you know, version of the elise, and it was on some demo thing, and then they couldn't export or import, it got trapped. So we got it at a great price, because um, we were going to rip the motor out anyway. And we then began our early designs on packaging, and this is the battery pack, which had to fit into this goofy space. And it was not at all what we wanted, but it was what we could get. Uh, in terms of the, the Elise. Um, and this is us, this is the team uh, fitting out the Elise with the first battery packs. And now the stylists you know, have all come in, we have our beauty contest and we select a stylist, uh, and Barney Hat, and it actually was from Lotus, and there's a long story in that some other time, but, but so he did a beautiful job. I think the, the Roadster came out great. And then they go into clay, which just kills me, because everything else is done in CAD, you know, all the mechanical engineers, tapity tapity tap, and the artists, you know, do it in clay. Um, they only do it in clay for a little while. But they build a quarter scale model, and this was a little video that I used to have of us driving the mule around. Now, we're kind of experts at raising money, so uh, this was at a board meeting, um, right before we needed more funding. Yeah. So we took everybody out on the, in the really wickedly fast um, uh, electric Elise and said, this is you know, what we're shooting for. It's not gonna be an Elise, but you know, this is the kind of thing, and this validated our battery technology. Um, so then, of course, we raised more money, and this was this was an easier round. All the insiders continued in, and we picked up a new one, Valor Equity. We were still uh, under the radar, though. We, wouldn't, we, were, we were telling very few people what we were doing, um, but word was beginning to get out because of this of our demo of this car. We opened a UK office so we could be closer to where ultimately we'd be screwing the gliders together. A glider in the car industry is a car without a motor. And so it's very common for a factory to actually make gliders, another factory to make engines, and then they do what's called the marriage, where they put the two together, and maybe even a third facility. Um, so Lotus was gonna do our, the gliders, we were doing the drivetrains, and they would do the marriage at their facility there. So now we're getting closer, we have vehicle packaging studies, we're up to 24 employees, which is pretty exciting. And then they go to full clay model, because you can't really see it in quarter scale, so then they make a giant mo clay model. Um, and uh, it was quite fun. And that is clay. Um, when it's all done, and there's all these iterations, and you go, oh, that's, that's not quite as smooth as we think it should be, and you know, the artists get all involved. And, but eventually you get um, a car like that in clay. And that has a uh, sort of a reflective film that's, that's sucked down onto the clay, because unless you see the shadows and stuff in the reflections, you can't tell what's going on. So they would cover that, and everyone would look at it, and ooh and ah, and say, ooh, we don't like this, we like that. And then they would just peel it off and continue working in clay. The moment that it's done in clay, and you sign off on it, it's digitized. And then from that point on, it's in the, it's in the CAD digital realm. Um, so this is not the clay model. So now we're doing aerodynamic studies, you know, the next month. And I said, you know, well, and they're getting these bids of these aerodynamics. Studies. Now, aerodynamics is nonlinear, so you have to do it in full scale. And they're getting bids from Chile and Argentina and the Europe. And I'm like, uh, you know, we only have one clay model. I mean, how are we going to get it anywhere? And, and they were like, oh, no, you don't use the clay model. You just beam the files, and they just make another one. So this is a file. And I'm, so you beam the files. the coolest thing. You, you know, FTP the files, and they print you a car. They actually take a, a giant block of plastic and a five-axis milling machine. And a few hours later, they have a car. And they put wheels on it. And they put it into the... And they do it all the time. They do, you know, all these companies. This is another example. This would have only been available within a car company 20 years ago. But now the car companies don't have this technology. It's all outsourced. So, you know, we got these competitive bids. So they printed out a car or CNC'd a car for us uh, in six hours or four hours or something, screwed it together, and we were off the races on the Aero model. The funny thing is when they were finished, I thought it was so cool. It was in Europe somewhere. I said, I want you to ship it to us. And the guy says, uh, no, this is the Aero model. We'll just put it in the shredder again. I said, no, no, no I want it shipped. He's like, guy, it's going to be like 1,000 euros to ship it to you. And I said, perfect, just send it. It's, it's still in the lobby of the uh, Menlo Park uh, uh, dealership, actually. It's really cool. It's all black. It looks really dramatic. It was at Burning Man for a while. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> and it came back all this dust, and it, it, took, it took the guys you know, days to clean it. Uh -huh. um, so we also had to develop our own motors because we needed that efficiency. We knew to get the efficiency, 
we went out to suppliers to do that, and it turned out that we could train the suppliers and buy all the capital equipment for them to make the motor, and then they would sell those motors to whoever they could, um, or we could do it ourselves for the same price. So we ended up weirdly manufacturing our own motors. Uh, by this time, we wanted another mule with our new drivetrain uh, and with our new body styling. So that's that's it's, that's mule number two. It's drivable, uh, very exciting. It used all of our own electronics, our own battery systems, and our own motor at that point. Uh, oh, and you can see the aero bucket, that black thing behind it. Actually, I didn't notice that. So 2006 now. So you know we're now three. You know we're working on three years into this project. Uh, you know this is not you know write the app next weekend and you know we'll have it out. So at some point you decide all the mechanical engineers are going tapity tapity tap and they're they're done. They think that they know what the car is going to look like and be like and all the mechanics on the side. And you tell them to drop the pencils, and you actually make some. So that's called an engineering prototype. So this is production intent. But everything is uh, done in however way you can get those parts out. So it's not production process, not production, but it's production intent. And we made 10 of those. And this is actually on a line where they were bonding some of the, the materials. And this is the first of the EPs, the, the, the engineering prototypes. Um, and they're like real cars. I mean, it was so exciting because, you know, you close the doors and it doesn't rattle and it, it, really, it really seemed nice. Um, now, we're still under the radar. Nobody really knows what we're doing. And as I said, you know, we're really good at raising money, uh, as best valuations we could get. So, of course, <laughs> we then raised more money because we had this incredible thing to show. And by this time, word is out, and we had a bunch of possible VCs all trying to get in. Um, it was the only time, it's still a total pain to raise money, it still takes time, but this was actually the one time in my life where, boy, the round came together really quickly. Um, although you never know until the very end. Uh, and we picked up a bunch of others. And then we launched uh, publicly. And there's a whole weird set of things in that industry when you reveal publicly. But anyway, we went ahead and did that and showed it at a bunch of shows. We had a big launch event down here in LA. Uh, and then we crashed them. The neat thing about this particular industry is you spend millions of dollars building these things and then you crash them into walls. And you don't get to do that in, very most, in most places uh, and not get fired for it. Um, so you get these really cool videos back of the cars crashing, and the crash engineers are astonishingly good. They, what it used to be is they would crash hundreds of cars or 50 cars or whatever. Now what they do is they crash them hundreds of times in computers using all of the error bars of the manufacturing process they know. And then they only crash a couple just to make sure it complies with the model. Um, and the big car companies have not had any discrepancy between their models and the actual cars for years. So they've, they've always wondered if they even have to crash any, and the lawyers are telling them, ooh, if something goes wrong, we'll be sued. So they still crash them, but it's really just to validate the model. Uh, and we've almost, we almost, we passed all the US ones. We didn't pass one of the European ones on the very first try. And uh, they, the, I thought, oh, shoot, well, you know, we can, and the models were like, oh, are the, the safety people, oh, we'll dial it out, that's easy. Um, that was, that we did really well. So we showed it at a bunch of fancy events, all PR, we never used any advertising, and we never paid for any of these events. Um, we had generated enough excitement that they would sort of ask us to take a premium spot for 100,000, and we said we don't do that, and eventually over the negotiations we would be, we, we would provide the cars and they would provide the space for free, because uh, we couldn't afford anything else, uh, basically. And then we're testing them like crazy. We have all these tests that we do to the cars, and one of the coolest things is durability tracks. Another thing that was only in the car industry or the car companies 10, 15, 20 years ago, everywhere on the planet, there are these durability tracks. Um, they're cobblestone race tracks. And the idea is that you drive the car around and it's unbelievably brutal and you simulate 10 years and 100,000 miles of wear and tear in six months on the car. The drivers that do this can only drive for a short period of time because they'll, they'll have kidney damage. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is incredible to think that you could do, I mean, I don't, you couldn't pay me enough. And then this is, they have these ladders that are down that are both, uh, actually one of my software guys was in the car and he said, wow, you know, I thought the car was gonna fly apart. And then when we went over the, the alternating ladders, I thought my teeth were coming out and I'd never had that happen before. But anyway, so, uh, and we began to notice problems with our transmission. Now, to get the performance that we had and the top speed we wanted, 
we had to have a two-speed manual transmission. And this was something we outsourced because we thought the car industry has been doing manual transmissions since the 1800s. They must know how to do this. But what we didn't realize is that the car industry, in many senses, don't have engineers in the same sense that we have engineers anymore. Because they've been doing something for so long, they have people that kind of tweak the existing designs a little bit. But if you say we want a two-speed, well, that's pretty radical. And then we need a parking pall, which is the thing when you put the car in park uh, automatics. Well, electric cars don't have any compression to keep the car from rolling away, so you have to have a parking pall, um, which is in every automatic transmission. And then we need it electrically shifted, because um, you, you don't want it clutches in a sense. And, but they do that as well, but they don't do it all at the same time. So this first company, which made transmissions, began to fail. We couldn't get them to shift properly. Um, but they were, but this time, and then this is a salt water bath that they, the cars drive through endlessly over and over and over again. Um, and we learn a lot. And all that, that information is being fed back into the design team. And things are being changed, and designs are being changed. And this is you know, Schwarzenegger driving the car. And if you notice, he's actually not very tall. I mean, he's, um, he's really big, actually, but he's not, he's not particularly tall. Uh, and we also drove them out on the, the ice. Another cool thing, there are these testing grounds in the Swedish frozen lakes. And this is our car going along. This is an approved photograph by the testing organization. Because what you don't know is that there's a Volvo and there's a GM car you know, right in front of and behind it. And these lakes are only frozen for a certain part of the year. And there's a lot of demand. So you drive around on the lakes. And well, the engineers that I sent there said that it was the scariest thing. Because you know, this Volvo would be like spinning by you, you know, and then it was your turn to go. <laughs> uh, but one of the neat things is, is that our car replaced as much mechanical complexity as we possibly could with software, which is you know how disk drives work now. We're, we used to do disk drives you know, long ago, four times. And so we were only there for a few days. And as we would dial in the stability control, our guys would sit there and tap it up, and then they would run, do another run. And um, the people on this, the ice had never seen anything like it. What would normally happen is the car would spin out. They would then park the car in these heated garages the team would go back to Stuttgart or whatever, and they would come back a few weeks later with some changes to the car to uh, make the stability control work better. In fact, it was so radical that Lotus um, called a halt to the project momentarily because they were convinced we were doing something somehow illegal, uh, somehow. I, I don't know what they were thinking, but they were convinced that somehow th we had faked the results somehow because we had made the changes you know, in an hour and tried it again. And it's that Silicon Valley sort of iteration the car industry was, is, is still not used to. They still can't do it. Um, it's, it's so obvious for uh, computer people. But. So now we're redesigning the transmission. Now we have a lot more money. So we have used, we have gone to one of the premier, one of the biggest manufacturers of, of transmissions in the, in the country. Uh, now we are interesting enough that big companies are willing to put up with our small volumes for the halo effect of being, being in the car. And we paid them millions of dollars to design this transmission, um, and it's going to be great. Same idea, parking policy speed. Yeah. And now we're building the, what are called the validation prototypes. So all that learning we fed back into the design, and now pencils down, and now we're building stuff, production intent and production process as much as possible. So these are the real cars. In fact, in the US, the laws are that these cars are so real that if you pass crash and stuff, you can actually sell the validation prototypes as cars. Um, so we come out with the validation prototypes pretty much on schedule, and of course, we raise more money. Um, and now we have even more people wanting to put money in, and it's great, although it still takes freaking forever to close the round. But we finally get the round closed. Everyone is really happy. The cars are gonna be out in, on the road in a year. All is well. We're beginning to take pre-orders. They're coming in really well. We have our factory actually making production motors. Um, we finally get the two-speed transmission. Uh, it finally comes. They were months and months and months late, uh, but it looks great on the dyno. The dyno's, you know, it spins and stuff. We put them in the, that's the motors being shipped, everything is going right. The final, uh, the validation prototypes, which were actually made on the line, not at line speed, but made on the line, come out. They are great. The doors really are right. We pass crash without any, any hesitation, both European and US. Um, and we get a measured acceleration of 3.86 seconds, which is what essentially our you know, spreadsheet from 2003 predicted. Um, so we were 
just high as a kite. Everything was going great. Now we'd spent millions and millions and millions of dollars more than the business plan had expected. We had, you know, it had taken longer, you know, we had all kinds of stuff going on. But we were largely on our revised plan. And many of those plan changes were caused by the board of directors and the investors wanting to do some change of strategy to actually make the car better. Uh, and so, you know, you can argue maybe it cheaper and dirtier would have been, you know, and faster, but, but you know, I, this was not a bad strategy. So we were pretty much on the revised plan, you know, 12 or whatever. And now we are in durability and all the transmissions fail and they all fail in different ways because the design is so poor and so screwed up that there's no way to fix it. Uh, and, and it's, it's just astonishing. In fact, in the court case, when they still wanted us to pay the final three, $3 million or whatever, um, they had to argue that everyone knows they're completely incompetent and the idea that we would demand a design that actually worked was not, um, was not <laughs> consistent with industry policy. And you, know, you can just, we won the case. And you can imagine <laughs> the, the PR department and the biz dev department of this company going, you know, I'm gonna just kill myself right now. That this is our legal defense, that we're always incompetent. And it's <laughs> uh, so the cool thing though is Moore's Law has come along. So remember, we, we designed this largely in 2004 and five, but now it's 2007. So the transistors that switch the motor uh, we used the best transistors we could. And we could get so much current through those transistors uh, at the time. But you know, International Rectifier, just down the road here, uh, was just releasing samples of their new IGBTs, which were a little bit more efficient. And what that means is, is that you can uh, put more current through there without them getting too hot, which means we can increase the horsepower of the motor a lot. Which again means if you change the gear ratio, now you, can only, you only need to use a single speed transmission to get the same zero to 60 time and the same top speed because we have so much more horsepower. So we fortunately, so we started a man, our redesign of the transmission. And this time we're gonna do it ourselves because man, the car industry doesn't know what they're doing. The second or third largest transmission company in the country contacted us and said, we can do it for you. And we said, you know, we're a little burnt on this now. Um, and they said, no, we'll do it on spec. You don't pay us anything. We'll ship them to you. Just give us the specifications. We'll send them to you, and you'll love them. And that's who provides the transmissions, and they're perfect. We, uh, as soon as the first samples came, that was the end of our project, and they've worked perfectly. Um, they actually knew what they were doing. So we're up to 260,000, or, or 260 employees. It's January. We've now passed everything. FMVSS is what you have to pass to get the cars to be able to be sold legally. We are set to go, except we don't have transmissions. We can't make the car go in that sense. And we're out of money. Not a good situation. So we had to do this extremely expensive bridge loan. And if you think, you know, April of 2008, you know, the world was a little bit kind of getting weird anyway at that particular moment. So the whole, it was just a bad confluence of events. But um, we managed to get through that and, and raised enough money to keep going. And by May, and this is actually, I left the company right as we were shipping the cars. Um, we, uh, the, the new, we had a this sort of interim drivetrain that we shipped cars and delivered them without the best performance, and then we replaced the transmissions later. Because we had all these production cars that we couldn't ship because of this one part. It takes 4,000 parts to make a car and only one part to not make a car. Um, so we had, and the transmission's kind of an important part. So we, we cobbled something together, we shipped them, and then our customers, thankfully, were very uh, uh, friendly about that. So we managed, and this is the store down here in LA, uh, and we began to uh, deliver cars in June of 2008. Uh, and that, that was great, we got lots of great reviews and the performance is just astonishing. We went through, my co-founder was ousted as CEO, it was quite public, and then we went through a few other CEOs and then finally in October, Elon stepped up and became the CEO. And he, he really should have been the CEO earlier when, when, he, uh, when Martin left the company, but uh, it took him a while to, I think, internally realize that he needed to also be running this company. He was busy, you know, launching rockets or whatever down here. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so he he then becomes CEO. Uh, and meanwhile, we had a team working on the sedan because we knew that the the the, the, the small car, you know, two-seater sports car market, is about three billion dollars a year in the U.S. with a base price above seventy-five k. So the low end Porsches don't count. So it's a big market, but. The really big market is in luxury sedans. It's, I don't know, 50 billion a year or something in the US alone. It's really, really large. But there's a lot of players there. So this is where we wanted to be. 
Uh, and we felt that we could get there only if we purpose built the platform because electric cars want to look different inside than gasoline powered cars. Uh, you want to have the, the batteries on the floor pan of the car so all the weight is right at the very lowest possible point so the center of gravity is super low. And then the rest of the drivetrain is really tiny so it looks kind of like a skateboard with a little bump on the back and that's the platform. Uh, and in a gasoline powered car it can't do that. So it really is a, a, an awesome, awesome way of making a car but you got to do it from scratch. So that was going to cost a lot of money. We, we knew we'd have to be public by that time. We had lots of different business models around that. Um, and we had all these preliminary designs and we had a team you know, working, working at those details. So now we're in production of the Roadster. Everything switches over to the Model S. Uh, and by March, uh, the Roadsters are you know, shipping out and we announced the sedan. And that's the, some, of the early, some of the early pictures of the sedan. June of 2009, you know, more and more roasters. I think everyone is familiar with this. We go public, which as an entrepreneur is very exciting, you know, especially, you know, that is ultimately, you know, what we need to keep the, our own entrepreneurial economy going is some kind of exit. So uh, we came out on, on the NASDAQ uh, with 800 employees. And by June of this year, we started delivering cars one of our first customers. He was also a roaster customer. Uh, <laughs> And uh, in fact, I think that's one of our VCs actually taking the, the very serial number one off. The car gets incredibly good reviews. It's really fun. I mean, I'm incredibly partisan, but I'm, uh, I'm very tickled with my with my less. And by this year, or by this month, um, they've delivered over 4,000. Uh, the stock is through the roof. I, I, you know, I did this, uh, you know, I don't know, a, a few weeks ago when the stock was at 47, which was a new high, now it's at 90, um, which, is, which is a little crazy. So it's a, a, about a $9 billion market cap. Uh, they just raised a billion dollars to pay off the government loans so that, that the government had these warrants that if we didn't pay back the loans sort of on time, they, they got, uh, I think, 3.8 million shares of Tesla. Well, you know, at the current stock price of $90, you know, 3.8 million shares is worth a lot of money. Uh, so we really, really wanted to pay that back in advance. And of course, there's a political reason too. You want that just off your plate. So uh, they raised a ton of money uh, on you know, last week or whatever, paid back the loan. So that's awesome. So the company is doing really well. They've announced a cheaper model. This is our, the plan. It was always every iteration is going to be nice, but a little bit cheaper. It's still going to be kind of an expensive sedan because uh, the technology, the fundamental electric technology is pretty expensive. Not the motors and the power electronics, but the batteries. And batteries get cheaper at about 7% a year on its natural kind of glide slope. It's sort of a really slow Moore's law. Or they get, if you keep the price the same, their capacity increases about 7% a year. So each model year, it'll be better. It'll either have longer range, if that's important mar for a market, or more likely it'll be less expensive um, and be a great car. So let's see. And I will say that not every EV is going to be a success. I get hit by this, well, you know, EVs is good, all these photos. You know, Fisker is a beautiful artist. He's the best stylist on the planet. He is an artist. He is not a CEO or an engineer of a car company. And uh, the Fisker doesn't exist anymore. These are also various failed, you know, goofball. I mean, who is going to drive something like that? <laughs> this goes back to our fundamental thing of the reason why electric cars weren't successful before is because they were lame. And there's no reason why you have to make them as punishment cars. You can actually make nice cars that are electric. Um, and it's kind of a big thing. One of the cool things is that every car company has announced some kind of EV, uh, whether it's using Tesla technology or not. You know, Daimler bought part of Tesla, as did Toyota. And uh, Tesla supplies uh, parts of their drivetrain for that. Battery electric car sales are going up, but still from an incredibly small base. Remember, you know, we have billion cars. You know, we're talking about maybe reaching a million cars that are electric, you know, in, in years from now. This is barrels of oil saved so far, and it's actually kind of cool because, you know, we are on this thing. But remember, that's 10 million barrels, you know, per year, and we consume about 80, 80 million barrels per day. So we have a ways to go, but, you know, it actually can make a difference. It's small, but, you know, it's at least some kind of difference. Um, and they're super fun to drive. <laughs> Uh, so electric is instantaneous. So you don't really notice this, but when you step on the accelerator of a regular car, there's a couple hundred milliseconds involved for the linkages and the, the valves to open up and actual horsepower to increase. 
And it's right at the threshold of perception. It seems really quick, but it actually isn't. And then if you have an automatic, there's a separate issue that goes on. Um, electric cars, it's a, it's a couple milliseconds at the most. I mean, the computers are pretty fast at that, at that scale. So when you touch the accelerator, the car really goes quick. One of our uh, early customers came in with this fancy car, and test drove one of the engineering prototypes, um, and, uh, and we were hoping to get him as an investor and you know, early friend. And uh, I thought the meeting went really well, and he gets in the car and drives off, and we're thinking, yeah, this is pretty good, and the phone rings, and he's all pissed <coughs> off. He's all pissed off, and we're, we're like, you know, uh-oh, you know, what happened? And he's like, what the hell did you do to my Porsche? You know, I spent a quarter million dollars on this thing, and it sucks now. Like, what happened to it? Because he had driven for 20 or 30 minutes an electric sports car with that instant acceleration, and suddenly his Porsche that he was so proud of really was kind of sluggish and didn't really do as not nearly as much as he thought. Um, and he bought one. In fact, I think he invested in the company. After that. But the Model S, this big giant sedan, you know, it's 4.4 seconds, zero to 60 time. So it's almost as fast as the fastest sports cars were seven or eight years ago. And yet it's this big giant sedan because electric is, that's it's big, it's one of its big uh, advantages. Uh, so they're really fun. Very quickly I want to talk about next, next opportunities in terms of energy because that's kind of my world. Um, there's energy storage sucks on the grid level. You got to figure out some way to do it. And there's a bunch of companies and I'm advising a couple on how to improve this. Um, smart demand response, this is an IT play, and it's just coordinating things on the internet to, you know, when, when the windmills, in California we have lots of windmills, and we have, which is great, except the wind only blows at night, pretty much. Uh, so we get this giant surge of power in the middle of the night when no one needs it. Uh, what you want to be able to do is tell everything that wants to charge up everywhere on the, you know, in the state, go for it now, it's really cheap. Um, and, and that's, it's an IT, it's an IT move actually. Uh, this is, I was in Belize uh, last month, and Belize is a fairly prosperous little, little country. Um, you know, it's poor, but it's, you know, it doesn't really have poverty in a normal sense. Um, and this is Marvi, the bartender, and, uh, and she just bought some solar panels. That are, that it's not her particular solar panels, but she did buy some solar panels. Um, and she had saved for years and bought them because her village, which is actually a pretty nice little village, has no grid connection, has no power at all, never did. So she was so excited because she had fans, and uh, she was saving up to get another panel and a little battery so she could power a refrigerator that she'd been given um, so she could actually refrigerate stuff. And we just, it doesn't seem possible that this is still going on, but in, especially in a country that seems kind of viable, you know, I mean, it's, it's a fine country, everything seems to work. And yet, they still don't have power. Uh, so I think there's a huge opportunity there. Even in very low capital, farming is really interesting for a variety of reasons. Everyone talks about resource scarcity, um, which is a big deal because we're actually consuming certain key elements at a fantastic rate. Um, we've used up, you know, half the world's supply of some of these things in the last 20 years. So, you know, at the current rate, you know, it's not very much further to go. Uh, neodymium is the one you hear about a lot because China happens to have it all. Um, I don't have any interest in it particularly. There's nothing in the Tesla that uses neodymium um, because. Uh, we use AC induction motors that Nikola Tesla invented in the 1800s. Uh, they're just steel. They're used in every washing machine and dryer. And you know, they're, they're the, any AC motor that you've ever used is an AC induction motor. It has no, new, no neodymium. The companies that chose to use neodymium decided to trade off rare earth materials basically for slightly easier software. And why anyone would do that? It's out, they're just out of their minds. I, I, you know, of course, I'm from Silicon Valley and I do software, so I just think it's, you, know, you do the software once and you're done. You don't have to buy that stuff from the Chinese every day. And this is, you know, sort of Chinese uh, production going into 2006, which is, but that's, a, that's an old story. Um, and just to close, you know, the future really is about sustainability, I think. I mean, there's lots of interesting business opportunities in, in all things, and, and everyone here is into some kind of business opportunity. Uh, but the idea of sustainability there is going to be a time, I think very shortly, where every company has to be sustainable because no one will invest in a company that says, oh, we don't have a, a plan to exist beyond the next 10 years or 15 years. I mean, it's going to seem insane. And it'll happen kind of slowly. And you see it in the plastics industry. You know, several of the companies that I, I know, of, they produce now sustainable, some weird chemistry, some weird chemical that's used in the plastic industry. 
And you might not like the plastic industry in general, but they're going through and replacing the various components of their world with sustainable, completely sustainable uh, chemicals that, that they use to make these other products because they don't want to be held hostage to resource scarcity and the price fluctuations. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, oil is now at $90 a barrel, and it's not going to ever get much cheaper because it's now costing $60 or $70 a barrel to make it. You know, peak oil is real. It's just real at a price. At $500 a barrel, we have as much oil as you would ever want. The problem is it'll be $500 a barrel because the $20 barrel stuff that we were using only in 2002 was $20 a barrel. There's almost no production left that the production cost is that cheap. There's a little bit in the Middle East, but hardly, even that's becoming very expensive. So things are going to get more expensive, and there's lots of ways of substituting these funny resources. And I think that might be it. Oh, yeah, and, and it's going to cause, this is my tagline for another conference, but anyway, um, you know, we're going to have to reinvent the whole world in this way. And yeah, that's a huge business opportunity. So, uh, and that's it. Yeah, thank you. Mark has yeah. about, we have an airplane to catch, so we yeah. have about 20 minutes or so of questions. Perfect, so if yeah. has questions. Yes. Um, first, congratulations. I mean, I think like over the last month, yeah. yeah. Um, second, thank you because uh, I put half my four on the hand test like six weeks ago, and I think you're going to say it was Yeah, okay, but, good, uh, good. Um, but my question is ah. about Tesla as a company. Yeah. Uh, by, by just, um, because if all, if all the electric companies had failed, it would be like 10 years before you'd be yeah, so, yeah, yeah. do it again. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Kind of got in there. Um, but my question is about Tesla as a company, and, and there's a lot of um, kind of chatter on the internet about the big companies are catching up and whatever. And when I look at Tesla, like, it just operates on a different plane, I mean, from the outside than like any car company. And I'm wondering how sustainable of a competitive advantage you think well, that is. So actually, you know, it's the funniest thing. I have had the opportunity to to advise several of the car companies after I left Tesla, and uh, it, uh, on their EV technology. And we always said internally that these companies really move slowly. They have a lot of entrenched interests. It's very political in these companies, and they're not going to be coming after us in any meaningful way in in, in a short period of time. That was a great story that we told. You know, to the investor, investing community. Um, and now having sort of been a little bit more inside of them, it's actually even worse than I ever imagined. I mean, it, it's, um, it, I, I can't explain it, but they will get there. But it is an epically slow journey for them. Um, one thing that has happened, which does imply that they are getting serious, is that all of the EVs prior to about a year or two ago, their funding came largely from either the advanced propulsion group, which is kind of where people go that they don't know what to do with, um, or the public relations budget. If you actually look where the money came from to build those cars, it was the PR budget. Now those car that technology is being funded by their, their drivetrain group. The problem is, remember I said that the car companies uh, refactored themselves and got rid of anything that they didn't think was in their core competency. Um, so they kept sales and marketing and advertising and styling, and they sort of they outsourced the styling quite a bit. Um, and they got rid of everything else, and they kept the, the engine. And they make the best engines. It's astonishing how you know, little it cost them to make a very sophisticated engine that runs for 100,000 miles. Um, that's what they thought was valuable. So they got rid of all the electrical engineers, for example. They don't have any of those. So the power structures are all around these internal combustion engines within the, the money of the company, these big companies. And it's really a struggle for them to say, oh shoot, we kept the wrong part. We should have kept the, the, <laughs> the electrical people after all. Uh, they don't even design the, the computers that control the engines. I don't think any of the car companies do. They out, they've outsourced that. They don't have any internal expertise in electrical stuff. It's, I just, I can hardly believe it, but it's true. Um, so they will catch up and they, they're spending money, um, but it will take a while. So I'm not incredibly concerned, you know, in the next five years that they're gonna have. And you know, <coughs> imagine a world where there's lots of competing great electric cars out there. Yeah, I, 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 that, that would be wonderful.
Yes. So I'm just curious, how, how does two guys from the ebook world decide to, you know, it's, of course it's a big problem, but it's a really, you know, complicated, uh, where do you get started on something like that? Well, I mean, are you, a, were you an engineer? And you yeah, I'm a software guy, and Martin's a hardware guy. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we had seen, you know, ebooks had, you know, batteries and computers, mm -hmm. and electric cars are kind of batteries and computers, mm -hmm. and they have a thing that spins, but that, you know, it's surprisingly similar. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, it sounds insane, but, you know, we had watched these batteries get better every year that we were in that business, and things that we couldn't do even a few years before, you know, we were shipping when we sold to, to TV Guide. So, we kind of knew that these were getting better, and then when the car industry said, you know, the batteries have been stuck for 100 years and nothing gets better, we just knew that was a lie. We just, you know, it, it clearly was a lie. Um, you know, and it, it, it was a stretch. I mean, I have to say, it, it sounds insane, but um, it does show you that you can really take a different tact on something. Um, for example, I think right now there's lots of industrial processes and 3D printing, everyone's talking about 3D printing. Well, that is going to disrupt manufacturing in some very serious ways, but it's going to take a while to really figure out how that's going to play out. But, and there's electric cars, I think, because the batteries finally got good enough. They weren't good enough in 2000, but by 2003 they were just barely good enough. And now they're getting, you know, pretty decent. Yes? So, first of all, I'm gratified to hear your career path because I did tablets 10 years ago and now I'm doing you. So oh, perfect! <laughs> it's good to know that it can happen. It absolutely can, yeah. Um, my question is, it, it may be tough for another company to come along and I think the big companies will do it, but they have a big problem because their sales channel, especially in the U.S., because franchises, yes. and all their salespeople want to sell what they know about rather than yeah, very small absolutely. volume of yeah. something new, which is a lot of effort to learn about. They don't want their customers to know more than them. Right. So I think they're all locked into it based on their PR budgets and wanting to do good, but I'm not sure they're going to see big volumes because there's this bottleneck around the channel. One of the things that we thought might be interesting is doing electric vehicles for stuff that is not consumer. In other words, fleet, industrial, Absolutely. all that kind of stuff. Does this make sense to you? Oh, uh, totally. And, about that? Yeah, and there are several, you know, I mean, if you look at the cost structures around, um, you know, the UPSs and even companies like Frito-Lay, they spend an enormous amount of, of money transporting their goods around on f with fuel. Uh, and they're all interested. In fact, I think all of them came to Tesla at some point or another asking for fleet vehicles. But they, but they wanted big delivery vans. And, you know, that was not, you know, startups can only kind of do one thing at a time. You know, it's hard enough to do the one thing. So we had a lot of, of interest from that. So I, I believe that is a, a big market because people were actually asking for them. We wanted to ultimately be making thousands and tens of thousands of vehicles. And, you know, even though a FedEx order for a few hundred cars or a few hundred Bands would be great. It wasn't the business we wanted to be in, but yeah, I think it's it's got great potential. Way in the back. How many? What? How many total dollars would it take to get the first car in the first customer hands? Like how many millions of dollars? Oh God! I mean, it, <laughs> uh, uh, I think so. We originally guessed. We were, you know, guessed. We originally estimated using our fantastic ability to see into the future um, and all of our great knowledge. It would cost about. About forty million to to get to get something into somebody's hands. Now that particular car that we were envisioning was not what we ended up coming out with. As I said, you know, we made lots of changes beyond what and it, that added millions and millions of dollars. I think it was probably a hundred million by the time. Um, it may have even been more. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Um, it's a little hard to tease out though because by that time we were also spending money on uh, you know the next product and we were you know we had a lot going on. But uh, yeah, it was, we were hugely you know, wrong on how much it would cost to, to develop. And that initial business plan, how, how, were you guys accounting for licensing out the drive trains and selling the chargers and batteries out to other cities? No. So, so what we did say, so we had, we wanted the business to be able to have a case of selling the cars and making money. Now we never, in the business plan, we specifically said, we don't know how we're going to fund you know, we can make this a cash flow positive business. We don't know how we're going to fund designing the next model because that's going to be a lot more expensive. Um, and, but by that time, we're going to have the world's best electric drivetrain for sure. And what we felt was other companies would come along, see what we had done, the, the big guys, and 
uh, more than likely one of them would want to license the technology or perhaps even buy the company. Uh, and, and so, but that was not, the business plan was always that we would be able to sell this product and make money and the company would make sense. Now, we also suspected that we could sell, along the way we learned about certain kinds of, 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 of subsidies in a sense. So one of the ways that we made money was selling what are called zero emissions credits uh, to the states that are part of this consortium of zero emissions thing. So uh, you have to come up with these, these, uh, these credits in order to sell cars in these states. And California is you know, in that group. Uh, so we ended up selling, and, and so every zero emissions car we sold, you know, we had got like 10 credits. And so we could sell those to the big guys for a lot of, uh, millions of dollars. But we, we didn't want, we, we didn't want the business plan contingent on a magical license agreement we didn't know would really happen or some, you know, law. Because, you know, we figured the law, they'll just change the law if it gets too expensive. You know, they'll wipe us out that way. So we had to have the actual product be viable on its, on its own. And anything else was gravy. And, you know, there turned out there was a lot of gravy, but we didn't, we, we, we didn't want the, the business to depend on that. Yes. Um, I've heard that there's a lot of issues with uh, tablets and electronics in cars in terms of regulation. Like, uh, where do you see that market going? Well, you know, the cool thing is that there isn't a lot of regulation at the moment. So, <laughs> there's so the the question, you know, about it's largely about driver distraction. I think is is the issue. Uh, so there are certain rules. You can't play videos. The, dri the driver can never see a video. Uh, you, you can't do anything that's that distracting. Uh, I was a little concerned with the very large panel that the, the Roadster has, and fortunately, we bought a one-year-old uh, Toyota minivan the same month that my Model S arrived, and it has one of the world's worst user interfaces, and I, it turns out that is way more distracting because you're whacking the thing and trying to get it to do stuff, and the completely intuitive and, and easy-to-use interface is actually way less distracting. Is distracting. There will be some new regulations around that, but nobody really knows what's what they're gonna what path they're gonna take. Um, you know, there's a lot of vested interest. There's a lot of interest pushing in directions that are perhaps not the best. But so you know, who knows? The rulemaking it in Washington is in, in impossible to predict. I just I have no idea. Yes. Oh shoot! You know, I used to know that number too. Um, so it wasn't so many lines of code. It had lots of computers though. So in the battery pack, there are 14 computers that monitor the battery pack. Now all that code said, each computer has identical code, um, and they all communicate and, and do this fancy stuff. Um, but they're actually, each individual computer doesn't have that much code. Uh, and then there's a computer that listens to that conversation and then reports that to the driver and to the other monitoring systems in the car. And there's another computer that talks to the entertainment systems and stuff. And then the, then the sedan has got, you know, five more computers or 10 more computers or whatever. Um, the sedan probably has you know, many, many hundreds of thousands of lines because of the user interface. The, the actual Roadster itself, the codes, I wish I, I, I actually knew that number. It wasn't so bad, but what was complicated about it is it's distributed over so many very small processors. So there's reasons for that, but yeah. Wait, over there. So with that number of 2.4 billion cars in the future representing a large raw material consumption, as well as Moore's Law and uh, self-driving cars becoming a thing, to what degree has Tesla looked at the idea that people might not own their own cars in the future while that, while that thing itself may exist? Well, you know, it's an interesting, interesting thing. I mean, the self-driving car is, a, is a, one of those wonderful disruptions that may, that may be really, really interesting. Um, the, you know, in the industrialized world, we appear to have passed through peak car, if you will. The, the number of cars people own is declining in all industrialized uh, countries, and the amount of miles driven uh, is declining in all industrialized countries. And that happened before the recession. It started in about 2006, 2007. Um, and there's a whole bunch of, of different reasons for that. Uh, social media being one of them, Amazon for another, frankly. Because <coughs> people don't go to weird specialty stores, they just click and it shows up. Uh, so. The, the, the industrialized world actually, the cars will probably decline a little bit and there will be more car sharing and stuff. I don't know in the emerging world, it's such an aspirational product that uh, I, you know, I, I, I have no way of knowing. And the factories are cranking out cars as fast as they can uh, in, in Asia. So I'm, 
it may be a while before we, we know that it's going to be big. It's going to be another billion cars, I bet. Yes? Out of curiosity, what OS is uh, currently? I don't know on the sedan. So the, the, uh, in the, the question was about the OS. In the, in the, in the Roadster, we used, um, in the little computers, uh, it was, we rolled our own because it had to be very, very small. Uh, these are very small computers. So, uh, and it, it, for what it had to do, there really wasn't, you didn't need an OS, per se. In the higher level machines, it was a uh, embedded Linux. Which I think is actually, a, it's something like that that the, the sedan uses on top, is an embedded Linux. Anything else? Oh, yeah. <coughs> um, you know, the first time you went for uh, fundraising uh, back in the day, said uh, there weren't quite very many assets, uh, no prototypes, maybe some intangibles. What, what was the discussion about um, in terms of valuation? So, you know, the valuation is always a negotiation. and. We needed to raise seven or eight million just to start, right? So, uh, and it's just two guys and a business plan, or three guys at that moment in a business plan, and some spreadsheets and a good slide deck, right? So, it's hard to argue you're worth fifty million dollars, basically. Um, but we also argued that because we were going to have to raise so much capital, if we weren't worth a bunch. Um, we wouldn't do it because the VCs would own everything right away. So they had to pretend that we were worth far more than than any reasonable person would ever imagine. So I mean, you know, it's a negotiation, right? You, know, you got to you got you got to they 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 know that, that you know we have to have own something at the end, otherwise we won't do it. So they won't kill the golden goose. I hope. Oh, last I think we only have maybe for one. What time is it? Maybe a couple more questions. Actually, right there. Right there. I, I yeah. was just going to ask about <coughs> battery technology yeah. and when you feel the next leap in battery tech is going to happen and how essential that is to. So, so batteries have been getting better at about 7% a year, uh, lithium ion cells, since they started. It's a really slow Moore's law. It's a doubling every 10 years, basically. And, and that's, you know, either if you hold the cost, it's doubling the capacity. If you you know, follow the cost curve as a halving of the cost. It's just like, you know, really sort of a typical Moore's Law thing, but really slow. Um, the, how we were able to get batteries, you know, we, we'd go to these companies and we'd say, we're going to, you know, we need some cells, and they would say, okay, you know, we'll give you five or whatever, and we said, no, we want, we want a lot of them. We want 7,000 cells, you know, and we're going to put them in one big pack. And the, the, the battery companies would completely panic and say, no way. Uh, because they didn't, they, they didn't believe you could do that safely. And as a whole, we spent millions and millions of dollars working on that. So, um, but how we got to them and why there's now, I'm, I'm optimistic that the prices are going to change. Remember, they print, they're, they're, they make about a billion of these cells a year, more than that, I guess. Um, and we would ask them, how big do you think, what's your fantasy customer? And they would say, how many cell equivalents does a fantasy customer own? And it was seven. It was, you know, two in the laptop and uh, uh, or two in the camcorder, uh, an extra camcorder battery, uh, and you know, three in the laptop or whatever. It was seven cells, and we would tell them, so we think your your idea of your maximum addressable market is completely wrong, because one of our customers will buy seven thousand of your cells. Each roadster has sixty eight thousand five hundred and thirty or whatever it was, so. Uh, we, we think that your, your total addressable market is actually a thousand times larger than you think it is. Not a little bit, but a thousand times. And you know, if you tell enough salespeople, even at the low end here, you know, the president of Panasonic or, or Sony or whatever will call you and say, what is this thousand times thing? Because <laughs> it really does, I mean, it's a big, big number for them. And you know it's already a multi multi billion dollar industry, and the idea that it should be a trillion dollar industry is is uh, very exciting for them. So since then, and with the success of of, of the various EVs, they they're all putting huge amounts of money to try to drive down the cost of of making a, a large format batteries. Now, we make ours up of, of lots of small commodity batteries, but you could also do it. It's, it's harder and a lot more expensive at the moment to make large format cells, so they're working on that. But there's just so much investment going into that that I actually think that the 7% a year 
is going to is going to be exceed. I think we're going to be better than that um, because they're all spending lots of money on it. It's, it that's got to yield a result somewhere. One last. Okay, la last question. Um, yes. How long till Tesla's fifty degree market? Oh, I have no <laughs> idea. I mean. <laughs> I, you know, if you'd asked me when is it going to be a $10 billion company, I wouldn't have been able to answer that, and I didn't think it was going to be last Friday. Um, so I have no idea. That's a, I, you know, I hope soon, you know, but I, I, it's got to, it's got to show sustained interest and in, you know, lots of product. And I think when the X comes out, that'll that'll be really big because it'll be a cheaper price point, um, and it'll still perform like crazy. So I, I think it'll be good. The idea and price point. Uh, whatever the website says, I, I don't I don't have any inside knowledge on that. So uh, anyway, thank you. Thank you.